Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all here. I know some of you may have a harder time seeing me. I am behind them if I'm behind your, the speaker here. I want to welcome you all to this service of worship at Covenanters, our third annual uh, Church on the Field service. This year, we actually have the privilege of doing this twice. Um, and so uh, September 11 at 4.30 as well. We hope to, it's kind of a twin billing. First question, who am I? The second one, who is God? And uh, it's going to be hard to, do, to answer the first question without getting into the second. They overlap and intertwine, um, but they will be distinct. My name is, is Martin Dendecker. I am the pastor. I have the privilege of pastoring this congregation of Covenanters and the uh, community uh, here as well. So on behalf of our church family, uh, if uh, you're visiting with us this afternoon, welcome. We're so glad to see you, perhaps for the first time, uh, maybe for the second, for maybe even for the third time. What we're going to do this afternoon is worship God. That's what we're here to do, to serve our God, to worship our God. These services are a service of worship to the God who made each one of us and the one who commands us all to worship him. He doesn't give us the option. He commands us to worship, and he will specifically call us to worship him this afternoon. He is the one who makes it possible for sinful men and women and boys and girls to come and approach him through Jesus Christ in worship. This afternoon, we enter into a holy dialogue with God. He calls us to worship him. We respond by coming. Central to worship is God speaking to us through his word, through the Bible, which is read and then taught to us through the preaching. When all God Almighty speaks, you and I must listen and humble ourselves before him. He is high above us, and yet, the, yet he comes down to meet with us, his people. And we respond to God in prayer, praising him for his character and work, thanking him for his care for us, confessing our sin against him, and seeking forgiveness and help in our great need, the need that you feel every single day. We are commanded to pray in humble faith, trusting that God not only cares for us, but he also hears us when we pray in Christ according to his will in the scriptures. God is the giver and sustainer of your life and the source of all good, and we humble ourselves under him and seek his face to shine upon us. Most importantly, God is the giver and sustainer of salvation. Forgiveness of sins and purity uh, is what he gives us through Christ, making us right with him and giving us the hope of eternal life. As we worship God, we'll also sing his praise with two familiar hymns. He is worthy of our worship, and as we approach before him, as we await his call to worship, let's take a few moments lifting our, our voices to God in, in silent prayer, asking him to meet with us, to bless us, and to speak to your own heart as you approach him in worship. So let's take a few moments in prayer. As we approach God in worship, please stand as he, hear, as he calls you to worship this afternoon. Please stand. God is everywhere, but in public worship we enter into the special presence of God. And uh, how can sinful and women enter into the holy presence of God? It's only through Jesus Christ and the way he is made. His blood has been shed to wash away our sin and to enable us to approach him. So hear the call of God to come and worship him from Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. 
and his truth endures to all generations. Let's pray. Lord our God, we have heard your call, your command to come and worship you and to do so in spirit and truth. Lord, we come to worship you. You alone are worthy of such worship. There is none other that deserves or can demand our worship. You alone are worthy. We humble ourselves before you, for you are God, and we are but men and women, boys and girls, created by you. We come in the name of Jesus Christ, for we are sinners who could never dream to enter into your holy presence without our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for the gracious invitation you give us as we come to you, reminded of the gracious promises of your word, that we can come to you for rest, find strength from you, find holiness, salvation, righteousness, and reconciliation with our God. We know, Lord, as we approach you in worship that, uh, Lord, you graciously invite us. We bless you for it. And you give us the assurance that those who come to you through Jesus Christ will never be cast out. Lord our God, through uh, Jesus Christ, we approach you, the sinless one who opened the way. Receive us into your presence through Christ. Receive our worship and bless us this hour. And for those here who may not yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior, nor worship him as their Lord, we pray that you would change their hearts this afternoon. And we pray these things with confidence, for we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please take your bulletins uh, and uh, turn in the inside. We'll sing our first hymn. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. It's on the inside of the bulletin.
Turn in, if you uh, have your bulletins, you'll find the scripture reading for this afternoon on the inside. If you have your scriptures, if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read the first 10 verses. You may have read them already on the invitation that we gave, if you received one of those. We're going to read the first 10 verses. I'm going to consider uh, verses 1 to 3 this, this afternoon, and then, Lord willing, on September 11, we'll consider verses 4 to 10 in more detail. Ephesians chapter 2. And you... God made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That concludes the reading of God's word. Let's take a moment to seek his blessing as we hear his word proclaimed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. For your word. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to us as it has been read, that this is your word, this is your declaration to us. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now in this time when the word is explained and applied, and you would reach our hearts by your spirit as it is preached. We pray that you would feed us with the bread of life and with the waters of life that you give freely. And we pray that our souls would receive what we need, both to understand who we are and, Lord, to come to you for whatever change is needed in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we pray that we would treasure this word and not put it off, but you would continue to feed us by it. Lord, we pray that we would be blessed by you in these next moments. We pray these things with faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, mirrors are a a good thing, a useful thing. I suspect that uh, most of you, if not all of you, looked in a mirror before you came this afternoon. You needed to make sure you didn't still have something stuck in your teeth from lunch or to make sure your hair was just right and every single one of them was in place. Why did you look in a mirror? It's because you knew it would give you Uh, At least if it's a useful mirror, it would give you a true reflection of who you are. So it would actually give you a true picture, and you can then correct what you see if something needed correction. Or if you're like one of my children, I asked them this afternoon at lunch, I said, what do we need a mirror for? And one of them said, well, it's so they can see how good I look. So perhaps that's you, which is you're in a good place if that's why you look in a mirror. You may have looked in, in a physical mirror as you, as you, uh, before you came here, and we're going to look in a mirror this afternoon as we, as we come to the Word of God. Of course, you've, you've come with, the, the, uh, with perhaps with that theme question of the message on your mind. Who am I? You want to know who you are physically? You want to know what you look like? You look in a mirror. Well, we're going to look a little deeper than the surface. We're going to look inside Now, you've come with that question, but you've also come with an answer to the question, who am I? You've come already with a mirror that you look into every day to tell you the answer 
and to hopefully give you something to live by. Perhaps that mirror that you look into is what we have, what, what is taught all around us and to us, a, a naturalistic evolutionary mirror that takes great faith to believe in, by the way. But you look into it, you, you look into this mirror, and what it tells you is that you are here, who you are is really something that's been come about by accident, something that is, came about with no planning and no purpose, and thus for you yourself, you look in a mirror at somebody who has no plan and no purpose. It's a defective mirror, I tell you. It's a, it's a mirror that will tell you something but to not tell you the truth. And every single day as you look in this mirror, it, you have to convince yourself that you do have a plan and your life does have a purpose, that you do have value, that you're not just a accidental creation of a bunch of cells that happen to come together, that you came from nowhere or headed nowhere and really have no value now. You need to convince yourself that we have value, that just intrinsically we have within us, there is some value, but we cannot place the source, nor can we be certain of it. And every single day, if this is the mirror you look into, you have to look at the mirror and you have to then change things. You have to convince yourself, no, I do have value. You need to find someone to tell you you have value. You need to lie to yourself, or at least admit that really you have no value or purpose at all. But if you're convinced, trying to convince yourself every day that within yourself you have value, it's no different than, you know, if you go to a circus and you go or you go to a house of mirrors or a fun house mirror, you know, those, those mirrors that, that, that are bent this way or that way, and you might look in one mirror and it shows you you're extra short and extra fat, and the next mirror shows you extra tall and extra skinny, and you have to believe, you're, you're, this is like trying to look in one of those mirrors and believing the illusion, but the illusion only lasts until you put your pants on and you realize it's just an illusion. You're still what you actually are. Now, one theologian, one well-known theologian, who a theolo theologian is somebody who studies God, studies about God, said this. He said, true and sound wisdom consists in two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. If you truly want to know who you are, you need to consider who God is, and you need to consider who you are. Not who you are as who you think within yourself you are, or what your experience is, but who God says you are. You need to look and see what God says. And so what God, and God has given us not a false mirror, but a true and perfect mirror that we're going to look into. He's given us the word of God, his revelation to us, his teachings, so that we can look in and see, look at in that mirror and see a true reflection come back at us, who we are. And also by his word to understand who God is. We have, again, these two questions. Who am I and who is God? They're very intimately connected. And as we look in the mirror of God's word this afternoon, particularly from Ephesians chapter 2, may God in his mercy enlighten our understanding. Show us who we truly are, perhaps for the first time. Perhaps as a renewal and a refreshing of who we are, who we once were. That we would see and seek from him the change that's needed. For God not only just tells you who you are, but he also tells you how you can become what you ought to be. So we're going to consider this theme. Look in the mirror of God's word to see that you were given life by God, died by sinning against God, and need to be made alive again by God in Jesus Christ. We're going to look in the mirror at those and see these three things, that you were given life by God, you died by sinning against God, and you need to be made alive again by God in Jesus Christ. Now, first, we need to understand and see that you are, you need to understand and see that you are given life. That your place, whatever the naturalistic of teaching of the world says, your place in this world is not accidental. You were created with a purpose. You were created with a plan. Genesis 1.1, the very first verse of the Bible, the very first statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then, as God created all things that we see, he then created us. Then God created man, male and female, after his own image. Genesis 1, verse 27. The pinnacle of God's creation, man, in his created state. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He made you body and soul. He breathed life into you. And he made you in his image. That means you're, you're, we're all, we were all made to be mirrors ourselves that reflect God, that those who see us would see God in us, would see his knowledge, his righteousness, and his holiness. That's what we were given. To be made in God's image means to have his knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. In other words, to know what's right, to do what's right, and to be what's right, to be like God. Now, the Bible doesn't argue for the existence of God. The Bible declares the existence of God. And, what, and, and, and while you, perhaps, sitting here this afternoon, wonder if God exists, or perhaps you think God doesn't exist, and yet because you're made in his image, you know he exists. You know that God is. Because though sin has marred his image in us, though we do not reflect him as we should, yet he has made us and that stamp of his creation is still on us. And because you are created, here's great news. Because you are created, it means you have value. It means you have purpose and value. Not because someone tells you you have value as in another creature not because someone tells you a value because you work hard or because you have good health or because you look good or because of some other uh, subjective way of describing whether you are a value or not a value that goes up and down depending on what someone thinks of you but you have value because your creator gave you value he made you in his own image you are valuable because god says so that's real value and you have real purpose when god created us he said he he blessed the 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 man and the woman he created he said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth god gave you and me a world to enjoy not a world to abuse. We take that verse today, and it seems like, well, that sounds like it's a ripe call to use our cre- uh, the creation to do whatever we want and to serve ourselves. But that's, that's not what it was like when man was sinless. He sought to use what God gave to serve God, to faithfully carry out his purpose. Thus, God could say at the end of it all, at the end of creation, it is all very good. This is God's declared truth about who you are, where you came from, why you're here to serve him, and why you have value, because your creator created you with in his image and gave you value. You're not going to find that truth anywhere else. You're not going to find that truth in any other w- view of the world. You're not going to find that truth except in God's word. See that you are given life. and you look in the mirror, you see someone created by God with value and with purpose. You were given a very good life with every blessing of God by which you could enjoy him and live in this world for his service, to live for him. But then you and I died. That's the second thing we need to see. You were given life, but then you died. You were made and blessed with every blessing to serve God. You were given every blessing to serve him. And God is good. When he commands you to serve him, he's not asking to do something that's evil. He's not asking to do something that's harsh. God is good. He cannot ask anything of us that is evil. But still, we weren't happy. Still, we wanted more. The first man who was created is Adam. And Adam was created to represent all of us. His obedience, if he obeyed, would reap blessings and reward for all of us when God gave this command of obedience. His disobedience would bring and death because it would separate him and all his descendants from a good God. And that's exactly what happened. He could have obeyed, but he chose not to. He, according to his his will, chose to try to not just not serve God, but to be like God. He disobeyed God. He broke his relationship with God, and therefore he died. Immediately, he died spiritually, and his body began to die in decay, and he faced an eternity of death. And he brought death upon all of us. That's what we call the fall. 
God made us good. We are at so high and we fell because we grasped for what was not ours and we disobeyed God. And from Genesis chapter 3, which is the third chapter of the Bible, all the way through the rest, we hear over and over again, we learn in different places the extent of that fall, how far we fell. What we're going to do this afternoon is just focus on these three verses in that open Ephesians 2 to consider what the scriptures say about the fall of man. Who you and I are now, we look in the mirror and see that we've died. Paul was writing, this is this, this, this uh, section of scripture is written by the Apostle Paul. He was an ambassador of Jesus Christ, a, a spokesperson for Jesus Christ. He came, he wrote this letter to an ancient church, but it comes with, by, breathed out by God for his church in all ages, for all of us. It's not time bound. It's for you and me today as well. Paul comes under God's authority, just like the whole of the Bible, whether the words were spoken directly by Jesus Christ or not. The whole of scriptures carries the same authority. They are God's words for us. What you're going to hear as you, and see as you look in the mirror is not, your, not a man's opinion of what you are, but God's declaration of what you are without Christ. Now, it's set in the context of actually the good news of the gospel, the good news of restoration. That as you look at what you are, there's good news to come. Paul is speaking to a people who looked in the mirror, saw what they were, and turned to God in humble repentance. And Paul is saying, this is what you once were, and but see what God has made you to be. But before you really want to know what God is, God is capable of doing and saving you, you need to realize you need to be saved. You need to see who you, who you are without God. If you're, if you're not following God, Jesus Christ, if you're not believing in him, if you're not serving him, not just as your savior, but also as your Lord, then this is not a description of what you once were, but what you still are. If you are believing in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer here, confessing faith in Jesus Christ, this is a description of what you once were. And for you to hear and to see again what you once were is to then rejoice in God, to say, wow, what has God done for me that I could not do for myself? He has saved me. We're going to consider this truth. Don't close your eyes, but look full on in the mirror to see who you are. The key statement that Paul has to say is you were dead or you are dead in trespasses and sins. And you might say, I'm actually quite alive. I'm here, aren't I? I feel not too bad. I have some aches and pains getting up in the mornings and getting harder it seems but i'm still here i'm still alive my heart's still beating but that's not the kind of death that paul is speaking of the fact that you have a broken body is a sign of this death but he's speaking of spiritual death that outside uh, because you're cut off from god you are dead spiritually you are both unwilling to serve god and unable to change that about yourself there is nothing in you that can give you new life. You are dead in trespasses and sins. That means you don't do what God wants you to do. You ignore his commands, what he tells you to do. And when he tells you not to do something, you do it anyway. And you live that kind of life of rebellion. Because you are cut off from the very source of life and holiness. Out because of our sin, we've cut ourselves off like a power line that's been severed. There's no power. There's no lights. There's no, there's no electricity going until that line has been reconnected. There's no internal power. There's no secondary generator you can, you can fire up because you don't have God. But you need God. And without God, you're spiritually dead. There's no power within. Look at the world around you. You can look at it, you can feel it within you, but look at the world around you and you see death everywhere. This world owes only death in itself. We're so confused is our world that we imagine death to actually be the solution to our greatest problems. Death is what we is is what we bring when we uh, ha when we are uh, we think of of, of uh, suicide as the ultimate escape. So we think or euthanasia, or abortion. The only way we can't create life, we have no way of creating life, we only can bring death. Death 
death is the solution when we tear down others. This is death in us when we tear down others, when we gossip, when we compare ourselves against others and tear them down to make ourselves feel a little more valuable and a little better about ourselves. We speak ill of someone else. When we get angry and lose control and yell at someone, whether that's in, uh, comes out of our mouth or is stirring and bubbling up in our heart. And we destroy ourselves. Choosing daily those activities that destroy us. Sinning against God. There's death in the heart and death in our practice. It comes out of us because we are dead. Spiritually dead. That's what Paul talks about. When you once walk, this is, what you, this is your walking outside of tr- believing in God and trusting in Christ according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan himself. He is the one who energizes your disobedience. Not the devil made me do it. That's not an excuse to get away from your sin. But the reality is that you are in slavery to him outside of Christ. He is the one who led the rebellion in heaven. He's the one who enticed man to sin again, rebel against God here. And he's the one you follow every time you blaspheme God through using his name and disrespect him, through worshiping a false god, through not worshiping God as he calls you to worship him. He's the one who continues to energize your disobedience. The reality is we want, this is what happened in the fall, we wanted independence. We wanted to serve ourselves. But you can't serve yourself. You are always in service to someone. And if it's not God, then it's Satan. The scriptures make that clear. According to the prince of the power of the air, you're now serving Satan. You're like that fruit fly you trapped in that cup with a cellophane wrap and a little bit of wine in it. And you you catch that fruit fly. It goes in. It thinks it's going for a a good swim and it's going to be great, but it can't get out. And it's lost. That's who we are. And by nature, by nature, We are disobedient to God. Not as we were created, but as as we've descended from sinners. Descended in sin. Paul says, doesn't exclude himself. He doesn't, Paul's not looking down on someone, uh, on them and saying, hey, you know, all you people did this. Paul says, we ourselves, among whom we also, we ourselves, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. You don't need to look in someone else's mirror to see what they're seeing. You don't need to go and compare yourself and say, hey, let's, let's look in the mirror with me and I'll see, I'll look back and I'm going to see, actually, well, I don't look that great, but I'm, at least I don't look like you. Now look in your own mirror, remove the makeup, remove whatever coverings you put on and realize who you are without God, being cut off and severed from God, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. Even your mind is fallen. This is where our world gets itself into so much trouble. We think we're smarter than God, not recognizing we've destroyed our own minds because of our sin. This is not, you are not born, despite popular opinion, a blank slate where you are neither evil nor good, and you get to choose, and eventually you make that choice. If that was the case, where are those who have chosen to do right and who are 100% innocent? If everyone had the opportunity, surely we'd find one or two or a few, even a few uh, groups of people, or if not one or two people. But we've not. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are commanded. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But we can't in our own power. Paul says you can't do this. You're not interested in it. You are unwilling to do it. You're unable to do it. And yet you can't keep that first and greatest commandment of God. Therefore, you can't keep the second greatest commandment either, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. We saw that splashed everywhere over the last few years. If you don't love God above all, and you're not connected to God with that life, you can't love your neighbor. Rather outside of God... As we look in this mirror, we realize we are by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That means the anger of God burns against those who are outside of him. God, though we like, though many like to neuter God and take away his anger and take away and say, well, God isn't really angry and he's not really an angry God, as if somehow that makes him a better God, we need to deal with the reality of what Scripture declares. 
God is just. God is holy. Do you want to serve an unjust God? A God who you can't rely on to do what is right and good because he just, when someone does something wrong, he just ignores it and, and, and lets it go. You don't want that kind of God. And that's not the kind of God that the scriptures declare. One sin against this infinitely holy God deserves an infinite punishment that you and I need to pay if we are to be made right with him. And if we cannot deal with it, then we will be under his wrath forever. That's the reality of what you look at in the mirror. Death now, death forever as a rebel against God. That's what hell is. An eternal punishment from the hands of a holy and a just God. That's who you are if you are a rebel and you are not reconciled to God. That's who you are. That's what you see when you look in the mirror if you are actually looking with open eyes and wanting to see the truth. This is what Scripture declares you to be. Well, we've seen that you were made, you were given life by God, that you've died. Look in the mirror of God's Word to see you were given life and you've died and need to be made alive again by God and Jesus Christ. Thank God. Thank God that verses 1 to 3 are not the whole of what God has revealed in the Scriptures. This is who you are, and you face the eternal wrath of God, and that's the end. It would be just, but it's not the end. God can make it right. If you look at the invitation we gave you, you've seen those invitations on the back. We had this text, Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, and splashed across it were the two most important words of this passage. But God, but God. God. And we're going to consider that in greater detail on September 11. But already now you know you need those words. Those are words that you and I need to hear because if we look in the mirror and are honest with ourselves, we recognize we can do nothing to save ourselves. We need God. The solution is not for you to go out and get yourself a trick mirror to try to make it look like something's better or to go get a fuzzier mirror to uh, maybe, maybe hide some of the, those, uh, those, those things you don't want to see, to pretend things are better than they are by lying to yourself. That will only get you partway through. That will only get you through this life, but it won't get you through the judgment seat of God. Nor is the solution to pile in front of the mirror all sorts of bags of money and to put all your friends in front of the mirror and your big house and everything else. All those things will disappear. And you won't be any different. You won't look any different. No, the only hope you have is for God to change you so that you will look in the mirror and see someone different to see who you are, but made different. God alone provides a solution that both affirms his justice and his holiness, his righteousness and his goodness, and his grace and his mercy as he gives the solution to restore in you the image in which he made you, the image of God in you. Because in, and in love, God has sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, who came as God, took, taking to himself our own human nature so that he could pay the price for sin that we could not pay. He was one who you looked at him, talk about a reflection, it was nothing that you would desire. He, was, he, he had no form or comeliness when we saw him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. These are words declaring the Christ. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we looked at him and we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. There's that rebellion. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We look in the mirror and see it's not a pretty picture. We look at Christ and we realize he's taken all that we've done to ourselves on himself that we would look 
be restored to what we once were and even greater than what we once were. Jesus Christ came and died to save people, his people, from their sins. He is the one who died the death that was required so that he could save you and me from what we've done to ourselves. He's the one who is, was raised from the grave after he had died, raised in triumph, accepted of God on our behalf. God said, I accept your sacrifice for the sins of your people. He's the one you must confess and believe in. He's the one who alone can change what you see in the mirror. Not changing the mirror, not making an, not, not making an illusion but truly changing what you see, changing who you are, because he makes you alive and frees you to faithful, good service in God's, in God's kingdom. Yes, you may still struggle with sin. You may still be tempted to follow the path that you were rescued from. You still need to be made more like God every single day. But no longer will you be called children of wrath. No longer will you be called sons of disobedience or daughters of disobedience, but you will be, you are adopted through Christ into God's family and declared to be one who is a son or a daughter of God Almighty. Again, that restoration with God, that reconciliation with God, you're reconciled to the one whom you offended. Believers, to you who have believed and confessed Jesus Christ to be your Savior. This is a reminder of the great salvation, what God had to do to save you and to rescue you. This was not a 99% uh, 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 God and 1% you, and it's a good thing you did your part. It's all of God. He saved you. He rescued you freely out of his love and mercy. It's a call for you to praise God to consider your own life, to look in the mirror and to see against the, the backdrop or to, to look in the mirror of God's word to see where, how am I living before God? Am I living out this purpose he's restored me to live? Am I following him and obeying him and serving him as I ought to do as he created and recreated me to do? If you're not yet believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a call to come to Christ, to serve him, to believe on him. And then to serve him. And daily, you'll look in the mirror and be able to see his restoring work in you. To see a different man, a different woman, a different boy, a different girl. Not a trick, but the truth. And God alone is the one who can change you like that. You are not yet what you shall be in glory. But you'll look in that mirror and you'll see I'm not what I once was. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And so look in the mirror of God's word to see that you are given life by God, died by sinning against God, and need to be made alive again by God in Jesus Christ. Again, if you've not yet believed, the call comes to you as you've heard God tell you who you are. You've looked in the mirror and seen what you are without him. The stakes are not to look in this mirror. The stakes are not to see whether you might be embarrassed because something, there's something on your face or your hair doesn't look quite like it should. And you might be embarrassed for a few days. These stakes are eternally, are, these are eternal stakes. The solution is not to smash the mirror and get a new one. It doesn't make this mirror wrong. But it is to come, confess, before God, your need of his changing grace. To see what you are, to acknowledge what you are, and to seek to seek from him the restoration that you need. And so the call is to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus Christ. He will change who you are. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the true reflection that, you, that, that, that your word gives to us. We acknowledge we may not like to hear it, but we must if we would know our need and receive the only solution, the one you provide, the one you've given us through the high cost of the shed blood of your own son. O oh Lord, 
May the conviction of our need for forgiveness and reconciliation be real. Oh, Lord, draw us to yourself in mercy. And whatever mirror we've been looking in, Lord, if we're not looking and seeing a true reflection of who we are, show us and bring us to receive the change that we need. The Lord draws to yourself in mercy. We thank you that you've not left us without hope. You've, pointing, you've pointed us again to the Savior. Thank you, Lord, for showing us truly who we are so we would understand truly what we need and then showing us the true Savior who can give us what we need. That we would receive him in faith. Give us faith to believe in him. Strengthen faith to persevere in him. Lord, for your word declares that if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. And after observing himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. We pray that would not be our experience this afternoon, that we would not walk away and forget or suppress or put the truth down and try to make ourselves feel a little better. Rather, may we be those who look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it, that we would not be a forgetful hearer but a doer, that is, to flee to Christ and by him to live for you, and that we would be blessed in what we do. Lord, we pray for our community. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to minister in this community, to serve this community as a church. We pray for every soul that lives around us. O oh, Lord, your word declares the need of every one of us, and our own experience affirms it every day. There is so much brokenness and pain and fear and discontent Ever since the fall, the entrance of sin and brokenness into the world, death, O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, save, O oh Lord, forgive and change us. And give us, your people in this community, a compassion and a love for all our neighbors. Whatever brokenness they've experienced and whatever brokenness they're living in, whatever sin they have. Lord, you know the struggles of each heart here. You know all things and you know the pain, the hurt, the temptation to sin, the service of false gods. Oh, Lord, leave us not alone in our struggle, but remember us and visit us in your abundant mercy according to our needs. We pray now that you would bless us as we sing your praise, as we receive your blessing and go home. Follow us, Lord, with your word, we pray. May we desire to come and worship you again and again, Sunday after Sunday, obeying your command seeking your face, and knowing your blessing. We pray these things in the gracious and good name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Take your bulletin, and we'll sing a familiar hymn on the back of the bulletin, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me.
each, may you and each one of us, by God's grace, be found in that place to know the rock of ages is our rock, our protector, our savior, being under Christ's gracious care. We'll now receive God's blessing, after which the service will be over. I will be here to talk uh, more with you and any, answer any questions you may have and to talk with you. Um, and uh, there is my information on the front of the bulletin as well. I'm here through most, uh, most of every week, and if you want to stop and talk, you're welcome to do so or reach out. There are also resources on the table, uh, full scriptures. There's the Gospel of John and a little booklet called uh, Ultimate Questions, which speak to this and other things, other questions that come to our hearts and minds. There's also on the table, it's been warm. Uh, there's water, there's some apples, there's some things. Feel free to go over and take what you need. And a reminder, if you don't, and an invitation, if you don't have a church family, uh, we invite you to join us each Sunday for public worship, 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. You are welcome. You are always welcome to come and worship with us. And Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll have another outdoor service. Our afternoon service will again be on the lawn, September 11 at 4.30, where we consider in more detail who is God. So come and join us then as well. And now receive the gracious blessing of Almighty God and be dismissed by him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.